I'm supposed to preach after that? Okay. If you have uh, children with you, we have a Bible hour that's going on. They're welcome to go out into the hallways and they'll be directed down to a classroom. So you're welcome to stay or go. Your choice. Well, yeah, it's Easter. It's the day. The day we rejoice in in a special way. A day that floats around on the calendar because uh, this, this is God's creation. And it's uh, the rhythm of what He has made and how He's made the days to go from one to another. The years to go from one to another. But at that certain time every year, certainly as the Jews reckoned it and had their Passover feast, we celebrate Resurrection Day. We've been in a long series. I don't, I don't think I've ever preached an 11 lesson series ever. But we started in Genesis 1, so, you know, that's part of the reason. Um, the greatest love story, of course, culminates in what we'll uh, see today. The love story fulfilled is where, where we will be today. The forerunner sent ahead of the Savior, who also arrives. This promised Messiah that the Jews have been looking for in silence for 400 years as no prophet said anything after the verse I'm about to read. And the Messiah came. But everything, and I mean everything, was about to change. You can change with the change or you can let the change roll over you. And that's sort of the way it went in the first century as Jesus went through what he went through. The people were so very ready for the Messiah. They lived in a time sort of like ours. The rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. And a lot of times it was because the rich were getting rich that the poor were getting poor. Because they would take from them. They didn't mind taking a widow and stealing her house, legally speaking of course, and then leaving her destitute to fend for herself. In addition to the, the lack of justice in the world, there was a lack of righteousness, and it's found its way into what we know as violence, which was the sin that caused the flood in Genesis 6. Go back and read it. God's not happy with violence. He never has been. And we're going we're gonna to allude to one of the most violent events in history today. We know violence was rampant because there, there were two teachings in the, the Sermon on the Mount for Jesus that, that kind of give us a picture if you could, you know, look into your own life and see where similar things happen today. Jesus made two uh, statements about what to do if someone were to come along and compel you to carry their pack, their load. Apparently, the Romans who were in power were able and, and certainly willing to just approach a traveler on the road and say, here, carry this. And the understanding was you had to carry it a mile before you could drop it. Jesus said, when that happens, here's what you do. You carry it two miles. You take the violence and you turn it around. The other was, turn the other cheek. We all say, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, we'll see in spades today why that's what happens. Because that's what God does. That's what Jesus did. And so he said, when people are violent toward you, the thing to do, if you want the violence to go down, is not repeat the violence and bring even more into the world. And so you turn the other cheek, and the violence, therefore, by definition, lessens. Violence was rampant. The government was out of control. It hadn't been that long since a very faithful young Jew had discovered at the entrance of the temple square an eagle with the current emperor riding the eagle. And that had been put in a desecrating way on the entrance to the temple. And when he uh, disputed that, it touched off a rebellion that caused crucifixions to happen so frequently that almost every city had a line of crucified people presently dying on a cross as you entered the city. It was the don't do this or this will happen to you card. The government was out of control. They were so ready. 
They were so ready to see their Messiah come and set things right. They, they had tasted it in so many ways, and the last thing that was said in the Old Testament, we're going to read again this week, we read it last week, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, sounds more like judgment. And that's why. Behold, I'm going to send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And with that, silence. 400 years. That rebellion I mentioned happened during that time. There were all kinds of Jewish subgroups that rose up during those years because they couldn't agree on how to make things right. They kept trying to fix everything. And the more they tried to fix it, the more broke it seemed to be. By the time Jesus, the Messiah, came, well, there was just a lot to fix. So, Jesus, in Mark chapter 9, I'm going to read some verses from chapters 7, 8, and 9. But this is when Jesus was coming off the mountain of transfiguration. The figure Moses, who had been buried... In no one's view, he was buried by God before they entered the promised land, so there was a lot of controversy as to where Moses was. And the figure Elijah that was promised in Malachi, who had not died, but was carried up into heaven on a fiery chariot by the angels. These two appeared on the mountain with Jesus, the Messiah. The disciples had identified that Jesus was that Messiah. He was that Christ of God. And so Jesus showed three of them this wonderful picture. But as they were coming down from the mountain, Mark 9, verses 9 through 11 says, He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked Him, saying, Why is it the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah indeed came. They did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Now I want you to, to join us on the roads of first century Israel where they had all these desires for what could be better, but they're beginning to hear something that seems absolutely unthinkable. They did to him whatever they wished? That sounds like what's already going on. What, what exactly does that mean? What does this rising from the dead mean? There was actually no concept for resurrection in first century uh, life. The pagans didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe that anyone was ever raised for any reason. While Jesus raised some people from the dead, they all died again. The idea of resurrection from the dead didn't even have a word that anyone would utter for fear they'd be laughed out of the room. So Jesus uses it and his own disciples have no concept of what that could possibly mean and rightfully so. But here's what the love story fulfilled looks like, and I'll show you a couple of verses. The Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, killed, and after three days, rise again. This is confusing. So go back to Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. He began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man." Yeah, Peter. Yeah, Peter, the one that said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. He goes to correct 
the Son of God in his view of what's about to happen. But it is unthinkable. I mean, God was first revealed in our lessons as we talked about Abraham as God Almighty. <laughs> this can't happen to God Almighty. That's, that's just an oxymoron. That's impossible. It's unthinkable. But the next verse, verse 32, they were going on the road up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Now, just in case you missed all of those, I'll just put them on a different screen for you. The Son of Man will be delivered, betrayed. That delivery will cause him to be condemned, condemned to die. Then he'll be handed over to our worst enemies, whose standard of death we've already heard about. They don't mind crucifying people and just letting them rot on the stick. And before they do that, they're going to make fun of God. They're going to spit on God. They're going to scourge. They're going to beat until He bleeds. God. And they're going to kill God. The Son of Man. The, the Son of God. Is this God's plan? The Messiah is rejected. The one they've been waiting for. The king is mistreated. The savior is murdered. This is God's plan. <laughs> and that just causes us to ask, does, does evil win? Is there any hope? How in the world could this possibly be turned around? Well, those things occurred. He was delivered. He was condemned in an illegal trial. False witnesses called him everything but righteous. They handed him over to the Romans who made fun of him. They spit on him. They beat him. And they put him on a cross until he died six hours later. It was one of the group that condemned him the court, who went to Pilate and said, I want his body. And he finally came out as someone who actually believed the things Jesus had been saying. And so Joseph of Arimathea put Jesus in a rock, in a tomb, and sealed the door with a huge rock that it would take help to get open. And so I think now you're kind of caught up with the story, right? Right? It's on Easter morning that some women went to the tomb. And while they're talking about how to get the rock off, they look and see the rock is back. The tomb is open. And while they were perplexed about this, there's no one in the tomb. Two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living one? Among the dead, he is not here, but he is risen. And catch this, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? Saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again? This is it. Have you ever been told something over and over that you didn't believe? And you were just pretty sure that, you know, when everybody quit talking, you're the one that was right. But you weren't. Because things really happened in an unexpected, maybe even unthinkable way. But the events and the prophecies and even the plan as, God, as Jesus began to explain it to his disciples, and remember the word was plainly, had left us all feeling like God must lose this battle if Jesus dies. 
That's not true. Because God's power wins. Now remember that one of my premises was that the government was out of control. I want to take us to Washington, D.C. No, not really. You don't want to go there anyway. I want to take us to Rome. Not, not the ruler of the country. The ruler of the world. I want to read to you three passages from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And I want us to paint the rest of the picture the way the New Testament teaches us. Romans chapter 1 is the first. It's right at the beginning of the book. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, and was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now that's the last ten lessons that I've preached to you in one verse. Okay, four verses. This is what God had in mind from the beginning. This is what has been accomplished. And the, the last stroke of victory is a declaration that Jesus is in fact the Son of God because He rose from the dead, never to die again. And then He goes on. According to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. Let me, let me short-circuit a lot of history just to say Paul was selected to take the gospel beyond Judaism because they wouldn't. Jesus said to. Jesus said, go into all the world. But they kept not doing it. And even when they were scattered, they still didn't do it. And so Jesus appears to Paul on the road to Damascus and says, Hey, you're persecuting me and I'm alive. I can feel it. And Paul has to change his entire mind about what his life is all about. And so he becomes one who is sent, an apostle. And he's going to take to the Gentiles this message of faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You've got to start there. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, there's really no future for any hope for anything. Period. And that is a message that needs to be obeyed. It is an obedience of faith. Skipping over to or chapter 5, the second of the three, Paul says, Therefore, Having been justified by faith. Remember that obedience of faith we talked about? It justifies us. And therefore we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. I'm going to stop there because that kind of takes us full circle, doesn't it? The message they, didn't, they did not want to hear, the Son of Man must suffer. No, 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 He can't do that. Yes, He can. He did. So guess what? You express your faith in Jesus Christ and they may mock you and spit on you. And they may even condemn you. And you can be glad that these tribulations happen because he's alive and he did what he promised to come and do. And there is glory from God awaiting. We stand in this place called grace. That is the realm in which we live. That's why he preached it as the kingdom. We live in grace. We don't live in America, we don't live in Rome. I'll show you the verse on that. We live 
in grace. That's where we are. In verse 8, he goes on to say, God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Remember the wrath of the end of the Old Testament? If, if you don't turn your hearts back the right way, I'll come and smite the land with a curse. We can be saved from that. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And we are introduced now to life and death as part of the story. See, the story is good news. Normally, when you talk about death, you're not giving good news. Normally, when you say someone is going to suffer, and they're going to be mistreated, and they're going to die, there's no good news in that. But the good news is, that's not the end of the story. That's not where the story ends. And so for us, we can have hope, because that's not where our story ends. So chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? If we live in grace, isn't the way you get grace by sinning? No tricks here. That's not how you get more grace. There's just plenty. May it never be. The King James said, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him. That's what you do with dead people through baptism, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. So we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. We lived in a world that was nothing but sin. Oh wait, we still do. Do you want to live in that world? Or do you want to live somewhere else? Do you want to live in the land of grace? In the kingdom of God? He tells us this path to peace. The path to peace is is we follow His path. Okay, that's not real exciting on its face. Betrayed, condemned, handed over, mocked, spit on, beaten, killed, if it takes it. They did most of that to Paul. The path to peace is we follow His path. Jesus Himself in these same times when He was telling what was going to happen to Him said, if, if you want to come after Me, here's how you do it. You take up your cross and you get on the road and you walk behind Me. But when Paul presents what that really looks like in our reality, there's some symbolism involved. My death is not to my enemy, the government, my death is to my own sin. And so I die, I am buried, and I am raised again the same way He was raised because God's power is great. It still involves tribulation. There is no, and we live happily ever after, and no one ever has any pain ever again. That's not part of the good news. The good news is, the world will give you tribulation I have overcome the world. And tribulation will not be the last word in your life. Trouble is not the last word in your life. Your struggle is not how it ends. How it ends is you give your life to Christ and He fixes everything really. This is what I was talking about a moment ago. It's Philippians chapter 3, just a couple of verses. 
Paul says, here's what I want. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. You see, the story that we know in our world is war. Oppression. Evil. I said these things last week. No one shook their head no. We all understand that. Let me add three more as I'm learning. As you know, probably in your family, certainly in your neighborhood, certainly at work, there is trauma. There's horrible, horrible pain. And when people are in pain, they just want it to stop. And so they take things. So the pain will go away. And then we call it addiction. How did that work? Not at all. And then we've got another problem. We've got to go fix that. You see, the faulty treatments from our world, number one, your addiction is a disease. Okay, I sort of get that. That's certainly how it functions. But I got there because I was in pain and I was trying to fix it and I fixed it with something that made me sick. Hmm. I think that's a faulty treatment. The other treatment that we're offered today is, and it's partly because these things are called a disease, you can't help it. In fact, we've gone from you can't help it, it's a disease, to you can't help it, it's normal. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been around some folks that are struggling with addiction. And I don't hear any of them suggesting that what they're going through is normal. I don't hear that. They don't feel that. All they feel is the same pain they felt before from the same traumas that are still active in their lives and they're just trying to find some relief. They're just trying to find somebody who understands and somebody who will take it away. <laughs> it's here. The last verse, Philippians 3, at the end of the chapter. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to wait till you get to heaven for things to get better. It's like saying the bread is in the oven. Okay, that's where it is right now, but in a minute, I'm going to have some. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of of His glory. By the exertion of the power that He has to subject all things to Himself. You see, when we call Him Jesus Christ, when we say He is the Messiah, there's another word that Peter added on Pentecost. He is Lord. That is the word they used for Caesar. And they applied it to the humble Jew from Nazareth. Because God really rescues. He really rescues. He does not mask our pain. He does not make it go away for a little bit. He really rescues. His power is of such a nature that He can bring life from absolute death. And he showed us, he demonstrated it on his own son. And he promises it to us if we want to live in the right world. Here's my challenge to us today. You want to just exist? Would you like to live? See, the bread's in the oven, but you can get it out. Some people say what we need is to change our world. Now, I... I'm one of those, you know, windmill-seeking world changers myself. I've spent a lot of years trying to change the world. 
out somewhere else. Finally came back to the church and decided what I really needed to do was do the Lord's work because that's where the world really gets changed. I want the world to be changed, but Jesus didn't come just to change the world for his day. Number two, some people want to change the government. A lot of energy is being spent on this right at this moment. You probably know about those methods and those hopes and dreams more than you know about the Lord because they're more readily available to us. It's coming in your mail every day. Your phone's ringing. All you have to do is do this and we'll change the government. Jesus didn't come to change the government. When Jesus left, Rome killed him. That's his track record with changing the government. But he did say to Pilate, yeah, I'm king. <laughs> and you'll understand that. And he so messed Pilate up, Pilate wasn't any good to hardly do anything but wash his hands. Here's the real solution, folks. We can change ourselves. Jesus came to tell the poor person, I can't make you physically rich, but what I have I give to you, as Peter said. I can make you so that your poverty doesn't matter because you have a hope that carries you beyond your poverty. I can't just erase pain out of the world, but I can make your pain be less important than what I've already done for you in the cross and what I will do for you in the resurrection in the last day. In fact, I can make it so that your life here does not exist in the realm of the world or the government, but it exists in my realm of grace. And so when you bring your pain and you say, you know, I, I really messed up, that's why I hurt, God doesn't say, well, sorry, you had your chance, bye. That's just so unthinkable. No, he says, I expected that. So how about we get back where we belong? Come back into the realm of grace where your sins can be forgiven and where you can go on and enjoy the blessings of life for real, not just existing. You change yourself by dying to sin. Allowing yourself to be buried by rising up from the watery grave known as baptism and then living in the realm of grace with Paul, Peter, all of the others who followed Jesus in his time, all of us who are trying to follow him now, all of us who still need his forgiveness. I'm not perfect yet, Paul said, but I'm pressing on because I live in the realm of grace. If that is your desire this morning, we're going to stir those waters today. And might as well help you if you'll come as we stand and sing.